Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining in. Um, my name is Tia Duan. I'm here with uh, Anthony from our Hey, office. everyone. This is Anthony with EW Klein. Um, so I want to do something a little bit different this time uh, rather than sending a, writing a, another article. Um, I want to do something a little more interactive, uh, but I don't want to do a webinar because uh, I don't know about you guys. Uh, since the COVID started and everyone working from home, there's been just so many webinars. I'm kind of burn out on webinars. Yeah, um, no more emails. No more emails and no more webinars. Yeah, a bit of a webinar fatigue at this point. So we're going to try something different, a little bit more interactive, uh, just a conversation between me and Anthony about a um, you know, knowledge topic that um, that uh, that we you know we just learned or we're learning. And um, then we're going to just talk to each other, explain to each other, make sure we understand it. And hopefully in the same time, you know, explain to you guys and, um, you know, let everyone the opportunity to learn a little bit about this topic. So. Um, so the topic today we're kind of talking about is uh, um, in really in heat transfer uh, rather than just vacuum about Fallon factor uh, versus uh, shear stress. Uh, this is something that I actually had to um, work on specifically to make sure I understand and design properly for planning frame heat exchanger from Alpha Laval on the several projects over the last few weeks. So um, this will be a good opportunity to kind of share with you guys what I've learned. So this is fairly new information for you as well. Uh, as of I mean, I knew, you know, Fallon factor and the uh, shear stress exist. I never didn't understand how they correlate or don't correlate to each other. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of had to go through a couple design projects to like do my butt kick and realize, oh man, that's <laughs> not the same. <laughs> well, I've heard those terms a couple of times. So uh, this is definitely a good one for me to learn on. Yeah. So um, Anthony, I don't, know if you, I don't know if you've ever seen like, you know, he uh, shown to you a plane and frame getting all fouled up, opened up looking like this before. Yeah, it kind of looks like honeycomb on the right, and like someone was making uh, some baking dough on the left. It's like a spaghetti maker. I'm making yeah. the yeah, meat grinder. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Yeah, it's pressing, making sausage. Yeah, yeah. So I actually had to clean some of these uh, heat exchangers in my previous job, like when it gets fouled up. I mean, they were wow. tough. Like the ones I deal with was like five feet long. So mm -hmm. we had like five feet long full of tubes, full of gunk and you know, gunky oil. It was, it was tough to clean out, man. And yeah. And if this gets fouled up on the shell side, I, I don't know. Like we didn't have, I, I, just, I didn't know a good way to clean it besides drop it in like chemical bath and just let it soak. Let it soak? Uh, hmm. Yeah, and just you know, hopefully it'll dissolve and break it apart. Um, but it, it was just, it's tough to clean a shell and tube when it gets fouled up. Um, yeah. And on the other side, the uh, plate and frame, I mean, you know, it's easier. It still gets fouled, fouled up, but like this one here gets fouled up, but... It's easier to clean, it's easier to get to. You can take a, a brush to it, or you can take, you know, just a um, high pressure water hose to it. Okay. And, and so the stuff. shell and tube, you have to soak them in chemical and kind of, it looks like you would have to ramrod a brush in there, whereas the uh, plate and frame looks like it disassembles easier and you can access the, the fouling. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a, it's a really big advantage for a plate and frame because you can get to the surface and clean it. I mean, we still don't mm -hmm. recommend like from Alpha of outside that, you know, we don't recommend you open up and clean it all the time because mm -hmm. uh, like these gaskets, you know, when you take it apart and put it back, you can damage those gasket. When you sure. put it together, you can press the plates, you know, with any, with anything like a laptop, you, know, you don't want to open it and then yeah. fix it all the time. Just really when it has problem, you know, then that's the last resort. But it makes it's, sense. Even when it does come to the point, it's easier to deal with a plate and frame rather than a shell and tube. Gotcha. Um, so, it's, um, so um, on shell and tube, uh, the concept of Fallon factor really heavily applies just to shell and tube uh, heat exchanger design. And, and you know, there's a engineer way of this understanding it with formulas and um, and charts and all that, but uh, all the math, <laughs> all the math and physics. And there's another way that I, this, I understood it. I wanted to be able to explain to other people in a simpler term. So the way I understood it is, um, you know, like in a uh, shown tube heat exchanger, you have like here's a tube, it's a two millimeter diameter tube, mm -hmm. and you have you know, this is the tube wall. As you put fluid through it, um, each fluid has their own Fallon factor. Uh, the Fallon factor is almost like a characteristic of a particular of any fluid. Okay. Um, and as it flows through the tube, um, it tends to, you know, have deposit build up on the on, on as a fouling layer that's on the inner side of the tube. Okay. So and as it fouls up, now you have a tube this big, and it fouls up, now the tube shrinks this big. So now you, you know, lose just heat exchange to the surface, and uh, the velocity of the fluid changes. So, you know, when somebody designs a shallow tube heat exchanger, they need to know what kind of fluids being put in through it, 
and then in the fouling factor of the fluid, so it's designed to compensate for the, the fouling layer. So ah, also, okay. Yes, it's kind of a, there's a characteristic of the fluid that it's designed to compensate for it. So Gotcha. So um, fouling is the prevalence of that specific fluid to tend to collect on the, the inside of the tubing wall, and that's what we call fouling. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and that reduces the flow. Right, yeah. And to compensate for that, you know, they just get bigger tubes. So that way, you know, same amount of same fouling layer, but now you just have more air to flow through or longer tubes. So it allows, you know, just still a similar amount of, amount of um, uh, heat transfer area or more tubes. So really mm -hmm. the way to combat against fouling a uh, shallow tube is just, you know, bigger tubes, more tubes or longer tubes. <laughs> okay. So just add more tubes and, and just bigger. more tubes. Yeah. <laughs> All more, right. More surface areas, more surface area to sure. heat exchange. Um, and there's some um, just typical fouling factor found online um, from an uh, engineer toolbox website. And okay. you can see just you know, every kind of fluid have their own fouling factor. Uh, just kind of, you know, measure it differently. Okay. Um, so the way I understand why there's fouling factors, you know, be important for shallow tube is if you look at the shallow tube design, um, you know, the fluid is flowing through the tubes. And in the tubes, you have the laminar flow uh, where, you know, the fluid. So we're at the center of the tube, the fluid is flowing higher velocity and towards the edges of a slower. So it mm -hmm. makes sense why, you know, the deposit will happen on the, um, uh, of the inner, sur inner surface of the tube, tube wall rather than towards the center. Sure. The so um, a plating frame is very, very different, you know, design concept completely and different physics at work. Um, so I don't know if you've ever seen a plating frame open up before. Uh, but since when it's open up and this is how it's designed, just a bunch of plates pressed together. So you have cold water going in and it goes up every other plate, mm -hmm. you know, not every plate, but every other plate and then collects at the top and comes back out. And the hot water, you know, or hot fluid goes down to the top and drops down every other plate as well. But, you know, the offset from the cold side, so mm -hmm. that, you know, you have hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. So yeah, so they're sandwiched in between each other. Yeah, exactly. So, and if you look at uh, the space between each plate, how the flow pattern flows, because there are all these ridges and you know all the grooves and patterns between the plate, the water flow is not laminar, it's very turbulent. So you have all this crazy mixing going on and all that stuff. Just by the flow geometry, like, it just doesn't you know, lend itself to that laminar flow where it allows stuff to slow down the edges and deposit. Okay. It, even so, more, sorry, mm -hmm. good. No, so just to, just to make sure I'm understanding, so, in the uh, shell and tube system, we've got laminar flow by design of the system, and that is uh, kind of conducive towards fouling to develop on the inside edge of the inner tube. Whereas with the plate and frame uh, system, that's designed to combat that by having more turbulent uh, fluid and reducing the overall prevalence of the liquid to adhere and it attached to the frame, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right, man. Okay. I wish I said better than that. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at, you know, also on the plate design too, uh, because the grooves and everything here, um, the the flow is actually kind of a corkscrew flow. Mm. So, so it's more even, turbulent. It's more turbulent to mix scenes and prevent it from, um, you know, you know, solid you know, dropping out of suspension. Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of like the that saying. Uh, a rolling stone gathers no moss. If we keep the water moving or the liquid moving, it's less prevalent to uh, to foul and, and adhere to the to the to the frame. Yep, exactly. That's right. I I learned something new. I never heard that saying before, but yeah. <laughs> <right. laughs> so um, you know, as a design philosophy, um, is my viewpoint design philosophy of a shallow tube. It's almost like it, it kind of accepts the reality of fouling. You know, as so a fluid has a fouling factor. And the designer just really, they designed something to compensate for it. So to make it, you know, bigger tubes, longer tubes, more tubes. Um, but, and on a shell, on a plate and frame, it's a bit of a different philosophy, I guess. Um, you know, seen the member of the um, Mythbuster show where I think Adam Savage was saying, his saying was, I reject the reality and substitute mine. <laughs> so I feel like with a, when we design plate and frame, I feel it almost rejects the fouling factor of a fluid. 
but <laughs> because we have the opportunity to design to minimize this to uh, uh, designing, you know, targeting shear stress. Yeah. Uh, and the shear stress essentially is just, it's what, uh, the way I describe it is how the, f it's the force at which the fluid flows to the plate surface. Um, and the higher that force is, then, you know, the, using your analogy of the, the rolling rock, means the, that means the bigger the rock and the stronger mm -hmm. the rock that flows, the more force it scrapes against the rock, the, the river bottom. Yeah. Less likely to pick up rock moss. That makes sense. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, just with playing a frame, you can, there's opportunities to, like, number of plates, the type of plates, the present depth of the plates, uh, how the like this, you know, geometry pattern is designed. Mm -hmm. They all have an effect on, um, you know, the shear stress um, um, the plate sees. So there's a lot of control with a plated frame rather than a shaman tube on preventing fouling. Okay. And also, and this is something else I learned recently, is that uh, the shear stress and fouling factor, they are kind of like, uh, kind of working counter against each other, really. Um, because it took me a little bit to understand this, but now it kind of makes sense. If you imagine, remember earlier slides, when we have the, uh, um, you know, the cross-section of the shallow tubes tubes. Mm -hmm. So once you prevent, you know, compensate with fouling factor, you make the tubes bigger. So you have more surface area. So sure. we apply the same method of, uh, you know, addressing this fouling factor, we're applying the same method in the shallow tube onto a plate and frame. So instead of making a bigger tube, now you're just adding more plates. Because if there are more plates, that means you get more surface area and essentially a bigger pipe. And then okay. when we have a bigger pipe, what happens now you have just slower flow, mm -hmm. more likely for you know solids and stuff to drop out of suspension and build up on the plate. So it's actually if you use the same design solution for a shell and tube to dress fallen factor, you'll end up with a really low shear stress on the plate and frame and actually become more susceptible for fouling. Mm, okay. So it's kind of yeah, counterintuitive on that. It took me a little bit to figure that out. It makes sense now. Is like if you look at this graph, it's kind of they, they kind of plot it out and show what, what the difference is. Like for you know really high fouling factors, if we design towards a really high fouling factor, mm -hmm. we'll end up with a really low shear stress uh, okay. scale, and then now it actually becomes really susceptible for fouling. Um, so, Interesting. And so the shear stress is not a component of the liquid like the fouling factor would be. Shear stress is inherent to the system and how it's designed, correct? Yeah, 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 okay. that's right. So we, 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 have a, we, have, we can control, manipulate the shear stress and not so gotcha. much the fouling factor. It's kind okay. of set for us. Okay. So no room to control the shear stress. Um, okay. It's interesting, too, actually, a couple of designs I did recently where I tried to... Um, kind of accommodate the fouling factor from the customer's uh, data sheet mm -hmm. and the you know over design the plating frame by like 60 percent you know like wow. yeah and the shear stress just gone to, you know gone to like 10. <laughs> oh okay that's got like just really bad shear stress I had to redesign it back and talking about redesign like um it's kind of rule of thumb for us to design shear stress you know at least 50 pascal okay. um but it's not you know, it's not cross board for every single fluid or every single application, but some fluids really clean. They probably don't. You have a lot of room. You don't have to go 50 pascal. Okay. Some, you know, it has tendency to foul up or really gunky and want to get really high up there. So um, you don't, you know, end up having to clean that heat exchanger every other month. Um, yeah. So 50, 50 pascal is sort of the uh, benchmark for where you want to start looking for a system. But depending on the actual cleanliness and the fluid, you can you can go higher or, or lower in terms of a, achieving the desired shear stress. Is that right? Yeah, 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 okay. exactly. So 50 is kind of a, a crude and blunt instrument to help us determine if it was a good design or not. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> it gets you in the ballpark. And so the yeah. higher the shear stress, the less we're going to have incidents of fouling. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Very interesting. So, yeah, so that's kind of the, the fouling factor and shear stress. So the last part is, Anthony, we uh, go move to a new place. So today you begin to a new office, right? That's right. That's a beautiful new office. Look at that bad boy. <laughs> we don't have our we don't have our nameplate up yet. Yeah, we got to get the nameplate. Uh, I'm excited. I think it's going to be fun. Um, yeah. Anyway. And we've been at what we've been at uh, Wayuka Road for the last what do you, do you say 45, 50 years? I was? think it was 42. I think it was 42. 42 okay. years at West Wayuka, I believe. I could be off on the on that, but. Um, a long time. Yeah, it's been quite a while. 
definitely yeah. <laughs> a lifetime worth. So uh, starting next Tuesday will be the new location, and uh, our phone number will be the same. Uh, everything will stay the same, but it'll just be a new location. We'll mm-hmm. have more warehouse area, I think, towards the back too. So we're implementing some service that. opportunities as well. Yeah, so very excited about it. And uh, well, I think that's it for us on this topic. And if you guys have any got questions, uh, comments, you know, shoot me an email. Um, or give us a shout on the phone, um, whatever works for you. And uh, feel free to share this video with your colleagues as well. And um, we're going to try to do this one again um, in about a month or so from now for another topic. Well, that was fun, TA. Thank you. I, I learned a whole bunch, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely, man. All right, take care. See you guys. Right. Have a good weekend. Take care.